then I will get started. All right, so thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, for coming and for the invitation to come speak here about my favorite two qubits. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to start with a little brief overview um, to kind of explain why I'm talking about two qubits. <laughs> uh, so the original invite um, asked me to, to talk about NMR. So I studied NMR in my PhD, which uh, I did at MIT in our nuclear science and engineering. Um, and as part of my PhD, I ended up at the University of Waterloo at the Institute for Quantum Computing for, for much of it where I did a lot of the research. Uh, so that's how I know Clarice back from uh, our PhD days. Um, and uh, like I said, I studied NMR and ESR, so nuclear magnetic resonance and electron spin resonance. And our group was really focused on uh, the quantum control aspect. So how do we use these systems to test um, different methods of quantum control. Um, and that turned out to be a really great background to segue into quantum computing with superconducting qubits. So since 2013, I've been at IBM Research, um, now uh, officially IBM Quantum. Um, so working in the quantum computing group um, on all, you know projects kind of spanning a, a lot of the experimental side um, in working with a lot of our theory team as well on um, calibrating our systems better and understanding the noise in the systems. And then how do we um, do demonstrations of uh, our capabilities and um, eventual applications that we might want to run on our systems. So hopefully this talk will give a feel for how, um, how NMR has laid a lot of the groundwork for other systems in quantum computing and what we can learn from some of the te techniques developed in NMR um, for quantum control in general. And you know, now why are superconducting qubits uh, so popular? So um, I'm going to start, oh yes. So everything uh, also just to point out, it's been quite a while since I've uh, discussed NMR in a talk. So I've, uh, I've got some uh, fresh new um, NMR slides, which hopefully hopefully paint enough of a picture before I, I segue into uh, superconducting qubits in my more recent work. Um, so uh, NMR is nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, if uh, if you're not familiar, familiar with this technology, you're probably familiar with MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. So it's the same technology underlying these imaging techniques um, as what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, uh, what I'm showing and a machine that you might find in a hospital um, and the work that I did in my PhD and what uh, a lot of NMR looks like is using uh, a spectrometer like this in the lab where you have some sample that sits in the middle of this, uh, this whole contraption which uh, houses a um, very strong superconducting magnet that uh, you can use to um, to magnetize the sample and then and then control and study um, the system that you're looking at. So this is used a lot for chemistry, for medical imaging research, um, et cetera, but I'm going to be talking about using NMR as a test bed for quantum control. So the very basic idea is that if you have um, some sample that has spin one half uh, nuclei in it, or uh, in the case of ESR, if you have um, uh, you just have electrons that you're studying, uh, which are also spin one half. Uh, if you put that sample in a very strong magnetic field, the spins will either align or anti-align with that field. So they'll be, they'll be sort of parallel to it, either up or down. Um, so I may refer to these as spin up or spin down, or to make the quantum computing analogy, you could think of these as R as zero and one states. Now, this is very different from an actual quantum computing context. These aren't really qubits because on average, um, the spins will give some net magnetization in some in one of these directions up or down, um, but really they're kind of all over the place. And we're just, uh, we're just looking at the net magnetization and controlling that. Um, so we refer to ensemble averages when we're talking about NMR because we're, we're looking at the average over many, um, many of the same molecule. So, you know, Avogadro's number of uh, repetitions of this molecule. Um, so already we're very much uh, in a different regime from uh, a, you know, a superconducting qubit system. 
Um, but it this is still uh, still very helpful re, uh, setting to to understand quantum control. So the, this external field, this strong field, which I'm going to start referring to as B naught. Um, this just aligns with spins, uh, but if we want to control them, now we would apply a field in the transverse direction, that's this B1. So if I apply a B1 in, uh, in the plane of, of uh, the page here, then my spin is going to rotate around that B1 axis. Um, so if I wanted to rotate my spin from pointing up to pointing uh, along Y, I could apply some B1 field for a fixed amount of time that corresponds to this rotation. Um, once I have a spin uh, pointing along Y or essentially having some transverse component, that spin is going to precess around uh, the B naught field. So this spin is rotating around this Z axis defined by B naught. Um, and it's going to do that with a characteristic frequency, which is called the Larmor frequency. So if I want to control this spin, I keep I apply these B1 fields um, on resonance with that Larmor frequency. So the B0 is a strong static field. The B1 is going to be a, um, a field that is oscillating at some frequency. For NMR, this is going to be radio frequency. Um, ESR will be microwaves, um, typically. And um, by changing the axis of this field, the time that I'm applying the field and the frequency that I'm applying it at, um, I can affect how I'm, uh, uh, what's the direction that the spin is pointing in three dimensions, right? Um, so why is control in NMR such a good test bed? Well, there's a couple of things that, um, we have to think about in trying to control uh, our system very precisely. So while we put our sample in some strong field, the strong field actually is not uniform exactly. So we have to take into account field and homogeneity. So here, you know, where I had this picture of a spin lying along Y, um, actually I might have a bunch of spins that I'm looking at the average over all of them, but they're all experiencing slightly different B naught fields depending on their position inside um, my spectrometer. So they're all effectively precessing at slightly different frequencies. So if I want to control them all, you know, they're going to um, they're going to respond to that B1 at a fixed frequency a little bit differently. Uh, Additionally, I'm looking at spins where there may be multiple spin one half uh, nuclei on the same molecule. And you know, I, I'm probably doing that intentionally to use these as different qubits um, in, in a, a, you know, a simulation of a quantum system. Um, but each of these uh, nuclei see slightly different magnetic environments based on their position in this molecule. So they, they're kind of affected by all of their neighbors and um, everything that they see around them. So this is called the chemical shift. Um, so they all kind of see a slightly different field as well, in addition to the inhomogeneities of the external B naught field. Um, and this is actually, you know, how we can study a lot of molecules with NMR, because um, we look if we look at a spectrum, uh, an NMR spectrum of um, of some molecule, we can distinguish the frequencies of each of these. Uh, um, hydrogen nuclei um, at, at, at different frequencies, depending on where they are in this, in this molecule. So, you know, if they're the ones that are coupled to um, the same number of carbons, they're gonna look very similar, but there's gonna be a small deviation between them, um, et cetera. So uh, if we wanted to control just one of these, um, we'd have to have very, uh, very precise control over our B1 field. Um, and you know, if we wanted to do rotations on multiple uh, of them at the same time, um, that also requires uh, control, uh, advanced control techniques. So what am I talking about when I'm, I'm saying controlling our B1 field? Well, I said, you know, you can rotate the state of that spin by turning on some transverse field and uh, you know, in practice, what you could do is just turn on that field for some length of time, wait for that spin to rotate to the y-axis, and then stop. Um, and you could try to, if you if you just 
you know, turned it on and turned it off, that would look like a square pulse in, uh, in time. And if I take the Fourier transform of this pulse, it looks like uh, the sync function here. So if I was trying to control, you know, uh, drive an excitation on just one of these lines, first of all, there's a fixed, uh, a finite bandwidth of this central peak here. Um, so this is, maybe this is centered on my main frequency of interest, but if there's something, uh, if there's an, uh, another frequency within this bandwidth that uh, I might activate, then I could have some uh, unwanted uh, control happening. Um, and additionally, the sync function has these uh, little sideband peaks, uh, which mean I could be exciting something further away in frequency by applying this pulse. So a lot of um, control is looking at how to better shape our, uh, in the case of NMR, RF pulses. Um, in the case of superconducting qubits, these are microwave pulses. Um, so for example, if I change the square pulse to a Gaussian pulse, um, and if I look at this uh, in Fourier space, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So this is just, uh, here's my pulse in time, here's my pulse in frequency space. Um, depending on how broad I make the pulse in time, I can make this uh, line with more narrow so I can more precisely target the spins that have a certain resonance frequency. Um, and there's more advanced techniques. What I worked on in my PhD was um, studying optimal control techniques where we numerically optimize the shape of these pulses to try to excite um, specific transitions that we're interested in. So like I've said, uh, NMR has been um, a test bed for quantum control. And part of what's so useful about NMR is that, oh, yep, sorry, is there a question? S sorry, it was the first, oops. It was the first, right? The very first. Uh, the first one? Or no, the first platform for computing or not? Yes, yes, I believe so, yeah. I mean, I guess there may, I, you could argue maybe there's been some tests in, in optics, um, but I think it was, yeah, uh, very early experiments um, and the first demonstrations of kind of canonical quantum algorithms in NMR um, were, were done in NMR. And I think, you know, part of this is because NMR is a really well-known technology, the, um, the science, the physics of NMR has been studied since, um, you know, 50s and 60s, very well characterized systems. We can simulate NMR systems very well. Um, so, you know, in the late, as early as the late 90s, NMR was proposed as a test bed for quantum information. And this is coming kind of right off the heels of a lot of excitement in the field around, um, you know, Shor's factory algorithm and, uh, uh, and quantum error correction, which you know gave a lot of um, impetus for for looking at quantum information and trying to actually implement some of these things that that could have practical applications. So uh, I think most famous demonstration probably was factoring fifteen uh, using Shor's factoring algorithm in two thousand one, um, and there's been a number of demonstrations since then, but these are really uh, you know, this is over 20 years ago, people were already studying these things in NMR. Um, so really, I think they uh, helped help drive a lot of the experimental effort that we've seen since then. So, um, you know, NMR is super great as a foundational um, uh, 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 technology and science to study quantum systems. Um, at the same time, we're unlikely to see NMR as a quantum computer in reality um, for a number of reasons. One is what I you know, mentioned right away, uh, that we're looking at ensemble averages. We are not looking at single spins and individually controlling qubits. So already we're kind of, uh, we're not meeting the criteria for true qubits. Um, addi there's additional um, drawbacks like weak measurements. So we can't, uh, we can't do a measurement that projects the qubit onto a certain state, which is, uh, which is necessary for, for a quantum computer and kind of um, maybe less fundamentally, but certainly very practically fundamental. Um, uh, we're just restricted by uh, the systems that's that are provided by nature um, to build NMR uh, 
quantum computers. So, uh, you know, we can study molecules in liquid state. There are different things that can give us maybe more um, spins that we can individually address. Uh, we can, um, there's solid state NMR, we can look at crystals and apply field gradients to, uh, to uh, individually address more spins, but we're much more constricted than we are in, in other systems just by what, um, what samples we can look at. So before I kind of totally shift gears into superconducting qubits, um, I wanna go over a few definitions and I know there's been a few of these seminars, so maybe some of these are um, kind of rehashing things that, that people have talked about every time, <laughs> but just to make sure that the language that I'm using is, is clear throughout this talk, I'll just go through these definitions. Um, so uh, you know, a qubit is our fundamental unit of information. There's a zero state and a one state. Um, and I'm gonna use this kind of block sphere picture throughout this talk, which um, I think is helpful for, for NMR and uh, the control techniques that we'll be talking about. This describes just a single qubit um, where the state zero uh, is represented by the point on the north pole of the sphere and the state one is represented by the point on the south pole of the sphere. But any point uh, on the surface of the sphere, sphere is, a, is a valid quantum state. Um, so anything like along the equator in the xy plane here is going to be a superposition state like an x, uh, like a zero plus one, zero minus one, um, that coefficient in front of the one defines some phase. So um, we'll get into that a little bit more. And I'll also be talking about uh, quantum circuits or quantum gates. And the circuits kind of our fundamental building block to quantum algorithms. So it's kind of the sequence of operations um, that, uh, that give us an outcome that feed into our overall algorithm. And there's some, uh, these operations can be, uh, mostly we'll be talking about quantum gates. So we have single qubit gates. These are the gates that um, produce superposition states or rotate or just, you know, rotate the state of a single qubit. We have two qubit gates. These are the gates that can produce entanglement. Um, other operations include measurements uh, and initializations and resetting the qubit state to, to the ground state. Um, in this picture, there's also some classical uh, uh, classical feedback included, which I'm not really going to be talking about today. Um, but these are these are kind of the building blocks. So to go kind of back to that block sphere picture and picture what a gate is doing, um, the state of my system can be represented by um, by uh, a psi with this form. So I have some amount of zero and some amount of one, and these these phases are. Um, define kind of the x, y uh, rotation. Um, in superconducting qubits, uh, I control the state of my qubit by applying microwave pulses. In NMR, I control my spins with RF pulses. Um, so the gate is just an operation that changes the state of the qubit. So I apply some energy, microwave or RF. It rotates um, the state of the qubit. In this case, if I rotated, rotated to the y axis, I'm gonna call that an x90 gate because I rotated around the x axis by 90 degrees. Um, I'll also talk about, uh, I might say an x gate to refer to just a, a bit flip gate, which rotates 180 degrees around the x axis. Um, and when I'm putting everything together, What's, uh, you know, when I'm talking about control, what we really care about is minimizing the amount of errors in this gate. So where can errors come from? Well, you know, when I'm, I'm uh, calibrating up that, that microwave or RF pulse, I might, uh, if I have a poor calibration, then that can cause some errors. So if, you know, my Gaussian pulse amplitude is too high, then I might over rotate beyond the y-axis here and not do exactly an x90. Um, there's some more kind of intrinsic noise uh, like the t1 and t2, so our uh, relaxation times or decoherence times. Uh, t1 decay refers to um, a, a thermalization or relaxation back to the thermal state in superconducting qubits. This is basically a relaxation back to the ground state. 
So in the block sphere picture, it's kind of a shrinking of the sphere down uh, in the direction of, of zero. Dephasing refers to a loss of information in the X, Y um, uh, plane. So this is loss of that phase information. So that looks like a kind of squeezing of this block sphere. So I, I can still have this amplitude information, but um, I, I'm losing, losing that phase information. Um, so T1 uh, uh, decay can, can come from uh, material impurities. So there could be some, uh, some two level system in my material that my qubit can interact with and exchange energy with that causes it to thermalize. Um, T2 uh, noise could come from uh, noise on my drive itself um, that, that sort of looks like um, it sort of looks like the qubit is seeing uh, different controls uh, over time. Um, and to kind of think a little bit more about that T2 type noise and how NMR actually influences how we deal with it, um, I wanna talk about one technique that's uh, very fundamental to NMR and that we use, I think across qu uh, quantum systems today, which is dynamical decoupling. So if we go back to this picture of um, my spins in a, in a magnetic field um, where that field has some inhomogeneity um, and all my spins are at slightly different resonance frequencies. If I apply that X90 rotation to bring my spins to the Y axis, and we just assume that we can do that, that gate um, well, if I just let them, just leave them alone and let them stay along the Y axis, they are going to slowly kind of fan out because they're all rotating at slightly different frequencies. So I'm assuming I'm kind of tracking uh, tracking the, the central spin as it's, it's rotating. So we would say these inhomogeneities are causing dephasing of that spin. Um, so what I can do after some time is apply um, an X rotation or a pi pulse, a 180 degree pulse, which flips the states of this, the spins all the way around the, y, the X axis um, so that they're now pointing you know, generally along the minus of Y axis. Uh, and now I'm still gonna have dephasing, but it's kind of going in the opposite direction. So after some time, they're, they're gonna be realigned along uh, the Y axis, uh, the minus Y axis. So then I could, I could continue, um, I, I could see in NMR, you would use this to see a signal at this point. Um, in, uh, in, a, in a quantum circuit, you might use this to, uh, to kind of just preserve that phase information for longer. So this, uh, this technique of applying a pi pulse in the middle here is called a Han echo. Um, and we regularly use this to measure, um, measure our characteristic relaxation times. We also throw these kind of echo pulses into more complicated sequences of gates. Um, and this snapshot is from a, uh, a pulse sequence on a superconducting qubit system. So this is something we've really directly borrowed straight from, straight from NMR. Um, okay. Okay. I'm sorry, can, can I ask yeah. a quick question? So uh, uh, regarding the Han echo experiment, is it, uh, is it such that uh, you, if you use the relatively uh, similar delay before and after the pi pulse, then the uh, ensemble um, average will, I, I mean, the um, inhomogeneity, uh, how do I say that? So, so the dark, uh, for example, the darker and shorter uh, blue arrow before the pulse and after the pulse, uh, because the delay is relatively similar, so it will cancel out if you look at the ensemble average. Is that what this means? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So in this, uh, if you look at the sequence of pulses that you might do, the delay before and after the pi pulse should be exactly the same to get this realignment. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, Okay, so I'm going to dive more deeply into superconducting qubits. So, um, you know, spins in a magnetic field, relatively easy to, to picture. Um, superconducting qubits are quite different systems. We, you know, we fabricate them out of superconducting circuits on, um, on a chip. 
Uh, so these are really macroscopic objects. You can, you know, these chips are, you know, a centimeter by a centimeter or something. You can see them with your eye. Um, and what uh, what we're looking at here, the this bit in the kind of darker box here is our qubit. Um, and this consists of um, essentially uh, an LC circuit. Um, so there's uh, a component right in the center here, which is the, the tiny part called the Josephson junction. That's our inductive element. And these two uh, large um, metal pads are our um, capacitor. So um, if you think about an LC circuit where you have an inductor and a coupler, um, this is called a harmonic oscillator. It, uh, it, it has some resonance frequency at which energy is kind of sloshing back and forth between the inductive and capacitive components. And that um, the frequency of that um, sloshing is the, the resonance frequency of this system. If you quantize the system and you, know, you can cool it down to a ground state where um, the individual energy levels are isolated, then uh, this looks like a, um, uh, uh, an energy level diagram like this, where all of our energy levels are equally spaced. Um, so if I wanted to drive uh, the system from the zero state to the one state, I'd apply a pulse at the resonance frequency. And if I kept doing that, I could you know, keep going up this ladder of, of, um, of levels. Now, since we want to use these systems for quantum information, we need to be able to isolate a zero and a one level to use as our quantum bit. Um, so the way that we do that is uh, by using this Josephson junction as our inductor. Um, it's actually a nonlinear element, so it kind of breaks the, the symmetry of this system. And um, instead of a harmonic oscillator, we have an anharmonic oscillator. Um, which means that the frequency between the zero and one levels is a little bit different between from the frequency between the one and two levels and continuing up. So if we uh, are able to control, uh, send microwave pulses at exactly on resonance with uh, this transition here, we should be able to operate between in that zero and one space without driving to the higher levels. So um, we can kind of ignore that those higher levels exist, although it will be a source of noise or error in the system. Um, so putting, putting, uh, putting these all together, if we want to operate uh, a system with multiple qubits, then we'd have uh, a chip that looks like this, where the dark boxes are our qubits. We can decide how we want to couple them together. In this chip, there's uh, superconducting microwave resonators that couple one qubit to the next qubit. We also use these. Uh, microwave resonators as our inputs and outputs to the qubit. So we use them to send controls or to read out the state of the qubit. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a lot of freedom really in how we design um, the interactions between the chips based on you know how strongly are these elements coupled together, um, what's the orientation of the connections and um, all of those, those types of things. And then zooming out a bit more, uh, our whole system looks like this, where we have that chip um, at the very bottom of um, this dilution refrigerator here. So this is our, uh, you know, there's a whole cryogenic apparatus that we need to bring the system down to its ground state and to um, have kind of a quiet uh, thermal environment. Um, so there's a lot of cryogenic infrastructure. We also have to get um, uh, enough inputs and outputs into this fridge in order to control all the qubits on our chip. Outside of the fridge, we have um, a lot of uh, room temperature electronics. So these are all the control, all the electronics that we need to generate those microwave pulses to control our qubit. So um, as I was thinking about um, kind of the journey from NMR to superconducting qubits, you can see uh, how very different um, working in a superconducting qubit lab is versus NMR. Um, these are pictures I took back during my PhD on uh, trying to make a crystal to uh, use as my sample um, and obviously leaving it for way too long. So our device fabrication was essentially just doing chemistry, um, leaving a super saturated solution to crystallize. Um, my control and readout lines were just uh, coils or microwave cavities where we essentially 
you know, it's like an antenna, you just uh, launch uh, uh, RFs, R RF um, controls uh, around the sample. Um, and there's no, you know, there's not this coupling uh, of, of elements together like in superconducting qubits. Uh, so this is very different, even though, um, you know, even though the uh, control techniques are, are very, very similar. So why do we like superconducting qubits? Um, you know, they, they kind of in contrast to NMR, we have a ton of freedom in how we design these de devices. You know, we can design devices with different connectivity. Um, we can change the design of the qubit or the coupler. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the kind of qubits that we use at IBM, which are transform qubits and they're fixed frequency devices, but you can add additional tunable elements so that you can change the frequency of qubits and that, that allows you to control things and do different gates in different ways. Um, but also having the ability to design the system means that by iterating on the design, you can also improve the qubit quality. Um, and by doing this, we've been able to get to very high fidelity gates. So uh, I, our best gates are uh, uh, breaking the, this uh, error rate threshold of 0 0.001, so a fidelity of 99.9%. Uh, .9%. Or if we were to do that, perform that gate a thousand times, there would be an error once on average or less than once on average. Um, we also like it because these leverage, superconducting qubits leverage traditional fabrication techniques. So, you know, IBM has a huge history in silicon technologies. We're able to, um, you know, make use of all the facilities and the knowledge that we have in order to build these devices, even though they're quite different from classical computing um, structures. And, uh, you know, over time, the um, what's been challenging with superconducting qubits is uh, their T1 and T2 times uh, had, you know, were initially very low. Um, and so much research has gone into that over the past, uh, you know, tw over 20 years since people have been studying superconducting qubits so that they've gone from nanoseconds now to hundreds of microseconds um, and really pushing the towards that one millisecond um, or, you know, kind of breaking that one millisecond barrier. So um, we still need more uh, more coherence, uh, a longer coherence times to keep reducing our error rates, but um, there's there's we, you know there's been huge improvements in the past, and I think we'll continue to to keep seeing that. So this is sort of reiterating what I've I've said before about how we control the state of the of spins in a magnetic field. Really, the same uh, on the superconducting qubit side. You know we we apply our microwave pulse. Um, so this oscillation represents the microwave frequency. Um, it's applied to our um, superconducting uh, input here, this microwave uh, resonator, uh, which is coupled to a qubit here. Um, this pulse is generated by some room temperature electronics. So there's a lot that goes into really finely calibrating this pulse so that um, we can precisely control the state of this qubit. Um, so I mentioned several sources of noise that we might see in superconducting qubits when we put these systems together. There's a couple other ones that we might be concerned about. One is state preparation. So at the start of our quantum circuit, are we really starting with all of our qubits in the zero state? And the first thing that we do is just cool our system down so that it should be um, the, it should just be thermalized to the ground state, but uh, you know, we typically there's we're, we won't be a hundred percent of the time uh, in the ground state, so we may have to do some additional operations to make sure at the start of an, a, a circuit that that the qubit's initialized in the ground state. Um, unlike in you know a spin one half system in NMR, uh, we can get leakage to these higher levels in superconducting qubits. So if I, you know, if my microwave pulse that I'm using to drive between the zero and the one states um, is too, you know, is at too high of an amplitude, I might just drive um, some off resonance tones that, that, that push me to these higher levels. Um, I also am concerned about crosstalk because I have these qubits coupled together um, potentially through 
um, through these other microwave components and there could be leakage of microwave drives or, or other types of crosstalk that I'm, I'm concerned about in these systems. Um, so when I put it all together, the picture that I like to use to think about noise in our system is this benchmarking pyramid or kind of the, you know, the benchmarks are the flip side of the, the types of noise that, that we care about. So at the base of this pyramid are our kind of intrinsic device parameters. These are that T1 and T2. There's some other things that we care about in superconducting qubits like ZZ, which is a static coupling term between qubits, which might influence how much crosstalk we have um, in, in our system. So we can improve, we, we, you know, we always want to improve uh, our T1 and T2. And this, uh, at this level, our improvements come from you know, fabrication, device design, all those things that are really intrinsic to the device itself. Um, the next level up is kind of our subsystem type noise. So when I start adding in the controls, um, I could have other noise introduced by you know, poor calibrations, like I mentioned, or noise on the drive. Um, so I have some, some techniques for characterizing um, my error rates of my gates that, that kind of are certainly influenced by these parameters down here, but there's additional things I can do, like improve my calibration routines to try to um, improve these metrics. And then finally at the top here is our holistic metrics. So when I put everything together and I try to run some algorithm, how, how well is that algorithm going to perform? Um, so this would capture, these metrics capture things like crosstalk between faraway qubits or, um, uh, you know, even, even things outside of my device, like how good is my quantum compiler to mapping the algorithm I want to run to the set of gates that I have available. Um, and here things like dynamical decoupling become very important um, uh, as well. So to go through a couple of these um, kind of higher levels, uh, I'll just mention calibration, these techniques. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned we might use a Gaussian shape pulse in order to calibrate um, calibrate the pulse that, that does uh, that X90 rotation. Um, so there's a set of experiments I would run through to, cal to calibrate up all the um, parameters of that pulse. So I do a Rabi experiment um, where I'd vary the amplitude of that pulse and measure the state of the qubit versus amplitude to find roughly where does, um, at what amplitude do I get the rotation that I want? Um, I might do a Ramsey experiment to calibrate up the frequency of the pulse. So I wanna make sure I'm exactly on resonance. This experiment looks like doing a, an X90 uh, and then followed by a delay and then another X90 and you vary that delay. And as a function of the de delay, you'll see some oscillation if you're off resonance. So this, this can help you measure frequencies. Um, and then for very fine tuning, we use uh, what's called error amplification sequences. And actually all of these techniques are used, uh, I think across the board, both in uh, NMR and in um, superconducting qubits. Um, these error amplification sequences, we, for example, for tuning up the very precisely getting the amplitude of an X90 pulse, we would apply one of them. So that would bring us onto the plus Y axis. Then we would repeat um, that X90 uh, in, in, in pairs. So we bring to the Y axis, if it's a little bit off, then we're essentially doing a, uh, a pi or 180 degree rotation to the other side of uh, the, bl the block sphere to the minus y axis. But now it's gonna be a little bit more off. So if the error here is epsilon, now I'm off by three epsilon. And I just keep doing this and measuring uh, kind of how far away from the y axis am I getting every time. And that allows me to kind of fit um, uh, and update my amplitude of that pulse uh, more precisely. And, uh, to, I wanna give just a little bit of an example on how um, calibration techniques kind of have evolved over time and adopted some of these control techniques to keep improving um, our gate fidelities. So one type of gate, uh, two qubit gates, so this is our entangling gate between, uh, that we would use between two qubits. Um, one, one type of these is called the cross resonance gate. So this is, um, there's multiple types of gates that you can use for entangling qubits in, 
in super in superconducting qubits depending on the exact uh, type of superconducting qubits you're using. Um, but this cross resonance gate is very convenient because it only requires microwave controls. Um, some other ones require additional um, magnetic flux controls. Um, so we use the same exact electronics that we have. We don't need to have any um, frequency tuning. Um, we just have our static coupling between the qubits um, that we can use to drive this, this gate. And the way this gate operates is we apply uh, a microwave tone to a control qubit, but it's uh, at the resonance frequency of our target qubit. And because they're coupled together, um, their energy levels are shifted a little bit. So there's, they're slightly hybridized, which means that when we drive this one, um, when we drive this qubit, we get a rotation of the target qubit. And that rotation is actually turns out to be dependent on the state of this control qubit. Um, so this picture is kind of an analogy to a, you know, a mechanical system, system of masses and springs where um, you, know, you can uh, drive this one and you're gonna get some interaction over here. Um, the challenges with this gate is that it relies on having an always on coupling between the two qubits. So that means that you know, if this coupling is very strong, we can do this gate very fast. But when we're not trying to do the gate, that coupling's still on. So if we try to do a single qubit gate on this qubit, we might still see some, something happen over here. So we effectively get uh, some crosstalk. Um, there's some complications because we do have higher energy levels in the system. Um, and it also puts a lot of design requirements on our, our devices because all the frequencies have to kind of align pretty, pretty precisely for this to work out across a whole large device. So over the years, we've um, developed a number of control techniques to keep improving this gate and reduce the effects of, uh, of um, crosstalk, that static coupling um, during this gate. So um, these are kind of three results that we had over time. I'm not gonna go too deeply into them. This first one introduced an extra control on the target qubit. Um, the second one is kind of a good example because it, it showed that we actually um, took those ideas of like the Han echo and dynamical decoupling, and we split up this gate into more pieces and apply different echoes uh, on our single qubit drives uh, in order to refocus some of the unwanted crosstalk terms in this gate. Um, so this is really expanding on that um, dynamical decoupling idea. And then more recently um, in this, if you just look at this kind of pulse uh, diagram here, um, this still used an echo, but also used um, a very strong drive on our target qubit, which uh, was a drive uh, in one direction for half the gate and then in the opposite direction for the other half of the gate. And um, this is lifted pretty directly from NMR. Uh, there's a, a dynamical decoupling uh, uh, idea of using, of do, using these strong drives and effectively doing a pi pulse in the middle this is called a rotary echo. Um, so these techniques are, are extremely relevant for, for superconducting qubits. Um, and I, I'm, I have some slides on some of our larger metrics, but I think, uh, you know, since I wanna have some time for questions, I might just say we have, uh, we have this metric called quantum volume, which kind of tries to capture the, the quality of the device as a whole and, um, this is kind of a single uh, single number that captures a lot of different things. And if anyone wants to ask me about that, I'd be happy to talk about it more uh, if there's questions. Um, there's a number of improvements, you know, both in terms of our gate design, our compiler, our dynamical decoupling techniques that have gone into improving even beyond the, um, the, uh, the gate um, definition itself. Um, so I think I'll skip through these um, and, um, you know, say superconducting qubits, you know, we've been very successful with uh, building larger and larger devices. Um, we have a roadmap to build, uh, you know, up to a, a, over a thousand qubits uh, by next year. Um, obviously for quantum computing, we need to keep, uh, keep going to larger and larger numbers of qubits to do uh, some uh, real um, interesting algorithms. So there's a lot of questions still about scaling, which 
Um, you know, even though we're not restricted by nature in the same way as NMR, we still have to be able to, you know, fit more qubits on a chip and have enough input and output lines in a fridge and enough controls to be able to um, control all of our qubits uh, really precisely. And eventually, you know, thinking about how do we connect uh, qubits that are across, um, you know, across different fridges or like, how are we going to scale it up to these, these huge, uh, huge numbers of qubits that we'll and need so eventually. Sarah, if, mm -hmm. I, if I may ask the question, in, in your previous slide, say right now for uh, Eagle or Osprey, how many qubits uh, do you, what's the percentage of qubits that you effectively do calculations on and the percentage of qubits that are there for error correction? Oh yeah, so that's a good question. So right now, these are these are all just physical qubits. So um, there's no error correction built into these systems now. Um, we we do use these for kind of testing building blocks of error correction. So um, these uh, I for you know we could test um, surface code like um, uh, techniques and correcting up to you know larger. Uh, uh, larger distance, uh, performing larger distance codes and looking at more complicated encodings. Um, but these are really physical, physical qubits, these numbers. Um, so we're, we're looking at, um, you know, on the further outside, like further from the device side, um, what techniques can we use to reduce the effects of errors in the kinds of applications that we're interested in, in the near future? Like, if we want to do quantum simulation, do we need a fully error corrected device or are there um, techniques that maybe don't fully correct the errors, but um, bring in um, some additional like classical processing to reduce the effects of the errors through error mitigation techniques. Um, so I don't have any slides on that, but uh, that's a really interesting <laughs> uh, part of research right now. Um, so I'll just kind of wrap up and say, you know, like I said, NMR has been really foundational to um, the history of quantum computing, experimental quantum computing. Um, coming from do, you know, a PhD in NMR, uh, it really has uh, been a great, um, uh, a great base to, to launch from, you know, to study other systems. And uh, you have a really good understanding of control um, coming, coming from that, that system. Um, and I'll just uh, highlight for people that if you want to learn more about quantum computing on superconducting systems, um, at IBM, we do have a bunch of devices which are um, online. So you can actually experiment on them for yourself. Um, so there's a number of devices like this five qubit device that are free for anyone. So you can you know, play around with it and um, even practice some of these uh, techniques that I've talked about. There's uh, on qiskit.org, which is our uh, open source software where you can uh, learn how to program a quantum computer. There's a lot of materials, uh, learning materials, like there's a Cascade textbook. Um, and I'll just throw some of these links up. The YouTube channel is really, really good um, for, for learning more things. Um, and I think I will stop there. Thank you everyone for your attention. I'm happy to take a few questions. I have a question. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, the presentation. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, I, I'm, I'm designing circuit uh, myself. So uh, every time I see uh, IBM quantum computing uh, circuit paper on ICC, it always amazes me. Like how, how, how accurate and you, you can control and then how complete the system is. So it's, yeah. So I, I just have a very simple uh, question. So I, I noticed that um, uh, not only circuit papers, but also physics papers, they, they talk about uh, Gaussian filtering in order to achieve uh, uh, purity on the frequency spectrum. Um, I, I, try to, I, I try to search, uh, but I, how, how do you typically implement this uh, Gaussian phase uh, pulse shaping? Because I, I can't seem to find a uh, discrete component that does this kind of thing. Oh, the Gaussian pulse shaping. Um, yeah, um, maybe let me go back to um, which slide. Um, um, maybe here. So, I mean, there's a, a 
this, these are really um, kind of microwave, con uh, microwave engineering techniques where um, you can shape the pulse by kind of combining your microwave um, tone with some, some envelope. Uh, so this is usually done, you know, could be done on an FPGA, but the, the idea is usually the same that you have some tone that gets mixed with uh, some envelope that's generated from an arbitrary, arbitrary waveform generator. And there's different ways to do this to um, kind of reduce the amount of noise um, that, that comes from it. But there's, there's generally a system of, um, you know, mixing, uh, mixing some base tone with uh, some shape uh, to, get, to get the more precise shape that you want. Uh, there are some very, you know, there are some fancy uh, electronics out there now that can directly generate some of these shapes, um, but uh, this is generally how how you see it in a lab. Oh, I see. So, so this uh, pretty much depends on how uh, if, if the uh, sampling speed of the AWG can can be uh, so fast such that the uh, from the point of view of the qubit, it looks like a uh, kind of like an analog uh, 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 envelope and yeah. okay. I see. Yeah, I mean, this there will be some discretization of this Gaussian pulse, um, which, um, you know, that could, that is something to consider. You know, if, you're, if your pulse is very short that, you know, you can only get a few different steps in on this, this Gaussian waveform, that could be a source of error. Um, also, it's also kind of tricky to figure out what does the qubit actually see because this also gets filtered by every component in your um, microwave line from from here to the fridge all the way the way down. So usually it probably gets smoothed out a bit, but there might be some other effects that um, would be, you know, will matter at some level. I just have one more question. So uh, what's the uh... Uh, pitch uh, between each qubit right now in order to have um, tolerable uh, crosstalk. Is there? Um, well, for first superconducting qubits, I mean, it's really a kind of design choice of trying to um, have the fast two qubit gates uh, without sacrificing too much on the single qubit gates. And there's, there's other, uh, um, I mean, there's other techniques besides, uh, you know, you can use control or you can use different device design to try to reduce some of the crosstalk effects. So um, we, we have some newer iterations of our devices where the crosstalk's actually lower. Um, we have, I think we have a couple of papers out uh, or the team does that um, show these kind of different approaches. One of um, adding additional tones to try to reduce the crosstalk um, or um, adding some other components to these to the couplers between devices to kind of cancel out some of the static um, coupling that that drives crosstalk. Um, so there's there's different approaches, but um, that's that's kind of always when you find that you're limited by a certain um, type of noise. You know, there's usually either a control approach or a device uh, design approach, um, and uh, we kind of um, probably need both. Right? Oh. So, so currently, uh, from the the uh, micrograph of the chip, it looks like uh, it's it's on the order of uh, I'm not sure. Is it a centimeter or like uh, because these microwave architecture they have to satisfy oh. certain wavelength uh, requirement. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, that's something that we have to take into account, like with the packaging of our devices and um, yeah, making sure that you're not just building like a microwave cavity <laughs> that can couple to everything. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is part of like the microwave engineering of the whole um, whole device, yeah. Thank you. More questions to Sarah. I have a question, Sarah. Mm -hmm. So Psi Quantum is making um, a similar roadmap claim to a million qubits using uh, photonics, but the same argument that it looks more like existing manufacturing uh, than not. 
um, with what you understand about the complications with both type of qubit, who's most likely to hit a million qubits first? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I can't say I'm super familiar with uh, the photonics implementations. Um, they, they do seem challenging in how, I mean, bo both are challenging. Um, I think with our roadmap, we're trying to do a lot of things in parallel to try to address all of these scaling issues, you know, um, how, how to lower crosstalk on these devices, um, how to uh, put more, more qubits on a device, how to connect them together. Um, I, I think we're doing all, all these things uh, kind of at once to try to get to that um, bigger picture that we're gonna need for a million qubits. So when, uh, you know, even these devices that we have now, 127 qubits, um, you know, it's hard to do an experiment that uses all of those qubits today, but we kind of need to do that um, research and engineering um, design and discovery right now to develop the technology that we need. So like um, that, you know, these uh, 127 qubit devices have more advanced fabrication processes and, uh, than our older devices have. So um, I think, you know, that's, uh, I think we're doing all these things to get to that point and kind of end up end up at that million qubit uh, milestone, you know, with everything kind of coming together. So uh, I I don't know I I'm not sure I can say how how that compares to to other implementations, but I think there's nothing fundamental for superconducting qubits that that blocks it from happening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Final question, Sarah? I have a quick question. I mean, we didn't have a lot of students here probably because of the mess up with the, the thing, but the students will have access to the, I, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you couldn't interact more with the, with the students. So question, do, do you think quantum computing now is starting to, to be more, engineering and, and less like science development. I, I, I'm not sure there's a way of writing this, but do you think that uh, it's just a matter of, of improving the technology and we'll get there? Or, or is there some fundamental thing that, that well? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say that like the, the qubits that we have today are where what we're gonna end up with uh, eventually. Um, I right now my my current role is working a lot more with the theory side and there's a lot of innovation that we have seen on some of these techniques that that I I talked about with your question before on error mitigation and how do how could we make um, applications um, uh, more relevant in the near term before we have fully fault tolerant devices. Um, so like the algorithm side, there's a ton of new stuff happening, I think. Um, but even, even on the hardware, like, yes, there's a lot of engineering challenges, but, um, you know, even fundamental things about, uh, you know, new qubit designs or um, new error correcting codes that are more efficient, like a lot of these things I think are, are still gonna be very important for a long time. Oh, thank you. Sarah, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your favorite qubits with <laughs> us. Uh, it was nice seeing you again, and I hope we cross paths at some point soon again. Thank you so much for, for, for being here. And uh, yeah, and, and I hope everyone has a nice end of their day.